Hey guys, what's happening? Niad here with Film Comics Explained. As voted for by everyone in the latest poll, today we'll be exploring The Brotherhood of the Wolf, the 2001 action horror and piece of revisionist history by Christoph Gans. Between 1764 and 1767, a creature known as the Beast of Gévaudan tore through the province in the Margeride Mountains of south-central France. The destruction left in its wake was devastating. Identified by eyewitnesses as a large striped beast with formidable teeth and claws, the creature was believed to be responsible for 610 attacks and over 500 deaths. The ruthless mauling stretched across 56 miles of rough terrain, and despite many claiming to have injured the animal, the evil remained within the woods. So terrified was everyone that new creatures would begin terrorizing the cities, that Louis the Beloved spared no expense of coin and manpower to hunt the animal or animals that were responsible. Set in the midst of the French Revolution, and loosely based on this legend, the film follows Grégoire de Fronsac, a knight of King Louis XV and his Iroquois brother Manny, who were tasked with hunting the creature. Narrated by Marquis Thomas Dapshier, an aristocrat in Gévaudan, the film opens decades after the event, with the nobleman receiving word from servants that he needed to leave. With King Louis XVI losing control of the kingdom, aristocrats like him are being hunted down and executed by peasants. Not only that, but there was a large angry mob outside his castle, growing in number and discontent. Despite this, wanting to honor the good men that perish in the event, he insists they bring him candles to continue writing his memoir. Like a true Frenchman, he also adds, I'm going to work late tonight. But sir. And my usual glass of wine. Marquis then explains the beast first appeared on their lands in 1764 and staked its claim, devouring women, children, and the men that dared get in the way. Importantly, the savagery only affected the peasantry, with the aristocracy appearing to remain unharmed. Within a year, the lands in other regions began to shudder in fear, praying the beast dare not take up a new home. People began to think that nobody could ever defeat it. As a result, Gévaudan fell into despair. Luckily, Grégoire de Fronsac and Manny, two gigachats hired by the king, make their way into the domain of death, bringing with them kung fu and wisdom from beyond the sea. Trailed by wolves, the pair stumble upon the vicious attack of a woman and her father by other peasants. Feeling disrespected by the drip Manny and Fronsac displayed, the idiots approach them. Of course, this prompts Manny to single-handedly rearrange their organs using unmatched perspicacity, coupled with sheer indefatigability. <laughs> Asking what they did wrong, Gregoire is informed the man was a thief and that his daughter was a witch. I'm a healer! I took care of the horses that won't pay me! Don't listen to him, sir! These people can't be trusted! And did he heal the horses? Yes! Believing the besieged family instead, he decides to take the money from the attackers and hand it over to the healer as payment. Interestingly, as the pair ride off, recognizing his title, the attackers welcome him to the land of the beast and warn them to look out for wolf traps. As they enter the town, Marquis informs us the two were neither hunters or soldiers. Gregoire was a naturalist and taxidermist to the king in royal gardens, and through the help of his mysterious shadow Manny, they had developed a reputation for being formidable and cunning. Arriving into the home of Marquis d'Epshire, the men are informed the house would give them shelter and support for as long as their mission lasted. Noticing the skepticism in Defronsac, the nobleman explains that their people would not be afraid of a simple wolf. The beast here was different. It showcased remarkable intelligence and hostility, not seen in other animals. I understand your skepticism, and I don't believe in dragons any more than you do. You may judge for yourself. Distracted by screams outside, Gregoire is told the family had opened up a hospital for the victims of the beast. The latest victim was attacked on her way back from the fair. 
While her companion scared the beast off and saved her life, it had destroyed half of her face. The following morning, Fronsac begins to draw a sketch of the animal, based on the recollection of a survivor. The boy tells him it was as large as a cow and had an elongated muzzle with knives for teeth. If it wasn't a wolf, what was it? The Diable. With our young narrator informing the men that another girl had been attacked near St. Alban, the trio make their way over to examine the site. Greeting them with hostility, a leader of a small military regiment named Duhamel arrives and starts cussing Fronsac for beating up his men earlier. Luckily, using his wit, the knight diffuses the situation, getting Duhamel to assist them and even apologize. I didn't know, Captain, that they were carrying out your orders. They were not. You did the right thing and I offer you my apologies. Asked what kind of gardener he was, the knight chokingly says that when Dumel's men kill the beast, the king wants it brought back to Paris for study. Fronsac has essentially been tasked with capturing its true nature on paper, explaining what it actually was and bringing it back to the royal court. Have you ever seen it? One time, sir. In 13 months, I had it in my line of fire. I shot it. My word, sir. I saw it collapse and revive itself immediately. Shown the picture Fronsac had sketched from the eyewitness account, the captain adds that it had a black stripe on its back with a line of spikes. Returning to town, Gregoire is invited to meet the most powerful people in the community. The Bishop of Mende, the Duc de Moncain, the Count of Moranger, Madame de Countess, their son Jean-Francois, Administrator Lafont, and Father Henry Saldus of the St. Albans Church. Complaining about Captain Duhamel's incompetence, Jean-Francois notes that he was unable to disguise his soldiers as women to lure the beast. Not only had the hunts exhausted the people, but with the beast still at large, the soldiers continued to devastate their lands. Is it to pay Duhamel that my taxes are sent to the ministries in Paris? I'd much rather give it to my valets. In addition to their assessment of the dilemma and thinly veiled disgust for the common people, the group also revealed that the Pope had sent a spy. Their mission, to determine if the beast was indeed a manifestation of the devil. Noticing a playwright fumble his attempt at wooing Marianne de Moranger, Fronsac approaches them and convinces the man he had an opportunity to write a memoir for one of the noblemen. With Marianne impressed and indicating that she was feeling him, my boy spits some game, laying down the foundation for the courtship of Gévaudan. And so, Mr. Naturalist, is our province to your liking? <sighs> for the moment, I've only glimpsed the beauty. During dinner that night, Fronsac tells a story that sits at the core of what he thought about the beast they all feared. He tells the group that they had caught a strange animal in the St. Lawrence River, a fish that was sacred to the Indians. Explaining its entire body was covered with jet black fur that was soft as a mink, the traveler showcases the animal, wowing everyone in the room. It's not until Jean-Francois, a hunter of notoriety, claims the knight had only a talent for comedy and deception that Gregoire admits the truth. The animal never existed, and his embalmer at the Royal Gardens was a skillful man. Offended at the charade, Marianne asks if the moral of the story was that there was no beast in Gévaudan and that the province was filled with idiots, but Fronsac simply tells her that the only moral his fable had was that we find dragons and unicorns only in books and poems. While not disregarding that something was terrorizing the land, he's approaching the case with Parisian skepticism. He's also learning a lot about both the nobility and how they truly viewed the victims, something that becomes remarkably important at the very end. Enough said about this evil beast. After all, it only devours vermin. Charades? With the king offering a £6,000 reward to anyone that caught the beast, a few days later, the largest hunt ever organized in France begins. Thousands of enlisted swordsmen, peasants, soldiers, hunters, and adventurers arrive to claim the bounty. Revealing her true ways, the woman Manny had rescued at the start and her wild friends attack him, breaking a few bones in the process. And when another sneaks up to attack him from behind, he's saved by Jean-Francois, who fires a shot and kills them in time. Revealing he was injured in Africa when he was younger, he explains that he was a hunter, a passion that cost him an arm. I learned a hard way that some wild animals need more than a bullet to bring them down. And no matter what Charlie says, well, you need more than prayers to Hilligan Green. Saying that a lion mangled and rendered his arm useless during his time in the Navy, he explains he got an armor and meant to forge him a specialized weapon. Francois even makes his own silver bullets as a signature for his hunt. Knowing the hunters would also be killing wolves, something Manny did not want to take part in as the wolf was a spirit animal. With everyone looking for the beast, Marianne, Manny and Fronsac stumble upon a chapel that had been burnt to the ground. It's here the knight explains that Manny was an Indian, an Iroquois from the Mohawk tribe, which is why he stopped her from shooting a wolf that approached them. Really? How could you have mixed your blood with that of a savage? A man is not a savage when he shares in your misfortune. The knight then explains that Manny helped him escape the English after the Battle of Three Rivers and that he didn't know anyone that was more honorable. Taken to the local brothel that evening by Marquis for a bit of fun, the men get their rocks off. 
Fronsac in particular gets a bit of special treatment from a new Italian woman named Sylvia, who reviews his sketches and appeared to be hiding something. At the same time, the narrator tells us it was the third winter they were living under the reign of the beast. The snow and cold was not able to stop it any more than their guns and dogs. As two young shepherds reach the foot of a cavernous passage stalked by the beast, Father Henry Sardis delivers a blistering sermon. Telling his own flock to remember the warnings of God, sent in the words of Moses, he states that the Lord will come unto them like a bear whose cubs have been ravished. Like a lion, he would devour their children and tear out their entrails. I will set upon you a ferocious beast who will consume you and your flocks and turn your fields into deserts. More than just thematic uppercuts, his words hold an important clue as to what is truly going on. At the end of the sermon, a man then rushes in and screams that God had punished him, taking his children. And with that, the knight, his brother Manny, Marquis, and a few of his men arrive at the cave entrance looking for the children. While the men stumble upon the dead body of the boy, guided by a wolf that leads him to a small hiding spot, Manny finds the girl in a catatonic state. Despite the small victory, having made no ground on locating the animal itself, the court begin to grill Captain Duhamel for his failures. And they have a point. The traps he set in the region have killed more peasants than wolves, and his men have begun extorting the population. More than that, since the epic hunt that killed many wolves, the beast has continued to kill, bringing down another 12 unfortunate souls. Despite their insistence that they were dealing with an unusually large wolf, Fronsac is adamant that his only certainty concerning the beast was that it was not a wolf at all. Contrary to popular belief, they rarely attack people, while this beast was deliberately hunting humans. I've seen wounds in the cadavers that no wolf could inflict, and I also found in the body of a victim this piece of metal. Also pointing out that no creature had fangs of steel, he reasons the beast was not an animal. Seizing the opportunity to feed the superstitious nature of the affair, Sardis tries to use the words of Fronsac to assert he was admitting to its supernatural nature. While the knight disagrees wholeheartedly, admitting only that he had doubts about the official story, they receive word from Paris. The king has essentially requested Captain Dormel and his men leave to join their regiment, making way for Monsieur Bottin, the king's master at arms to take control of the hunt. In the meantime, the taxidermist in Casanova continues to woo Marianne. Although Fronsac was initially charged with studying the beast with detailed notes, Monsieur Bottin has other plans. Telling the knight he believed the beast was actually a wolf, Bottin explains that he and his experienced soldiers were going to hunt for the animal. Worryingly, the arrogant man also tells Fronsac that he was dismissed. As they wait their return, Manny sneaks into the hospital and uses medicine stored in his bracelet to heal the girl he'd rescued. At the same time, Fronsac goes over the reports, trying to find a pattern to the attacks on the map to no avail. Bursting into the room, Marquis urges the man to join him. Awaiting him in the hospital is an angry crowd and a furious priest that announces he saw Manny using poison while reciting satanic incantations. Ordering them to let his brother go, the knight tells the priest it was an Indian remedy, but is told that only prayers would save her. Miraculously, the shepherd's daughter regains consciousness, alleviating any suspicion the healer meant any harm. It's here that Fronsac and Manny hear something never before mentioned in the records, with the girl claiming there was a man with the beast, no doubt its master. Unfortunately, everyone else believed the girl was out of her mind. Before he had time to pursue the matter further, he's taken into the dungeons by Bauturn's men, who explained they killed the beast with ten bullets. Shown a dead wolf, he's ordered to begin his taxidermy work. Despite protesting that they knew the beast had jaws that were two times the size of the animal before him, Bauturn explains that he had all the tools he needed to fix that. As you know, I must bring the beast back to Paris, and I have only this wolf, so you're going to make me a beast. Worse still, this was supposedly the request of the king, who had grown tired of the wild fables growing within his kingdom, and so threatened with the news that their monarch would be disappointed by insubordination. Alluding to the notion that he and Manny would likely be executed, Fronsac does what is asked of him. Not realizing that Sylvia was the agent sent by the Vatican to investigate the hunt, Fronsac visits the brothel once again, sadly revealing that Bauturn had killed a wolf. He's an imposter, and I am his accomplice. Adding salt to the wound, Jean-Francois recovers a sketch the knight made of Sylvia and shows it to Marianne. Feeling betrayed, Marianne refuses to speak to Fronsac ever again and retreats into the arms of her conniving brother. With Bauturn unveiling the beast of the royal court, the knight arrives and is introduced to Monsieur Mercier. In charge of affairs of the interior, it was a special counsel to his majesty that had organized this fake victory. It's here that Mercier reveals a problem, murmurs of a revolution sparked by a manifesto disguised as a novel that threatened to undermine the king's authority. 
If I understand you, sir, it is better to lie than to let lies be spread. The beast was causing a problem. No more beast, no more problem. Although the knight points out the beast will continue to kill, Mercier reveals the important part was that no one would hear the beast again. Buttering the deal of lies, the Minister of Deception says that they know he would like to go to Africa and have arranged a charter for him on a vessel bound for Senegal. As the attacks continue, Sylvia comes in with the assist, visiting Marianne and explaining Fronsac only ever loved her. Although downtrodden and beaten by circumstance, Fronsac decides to head back to Gévaudan when Marquis arrives with a love letter from Marianne. And so, as Manny and Marquis prepare for a secret hunt in a few days, this time without men or assistance from the king, Fronsac meets up with his lover. With Marianne revealing she wanted to leave her family, he tells her that they will leave for Paris in a week after the hunt is over. Unfortunately, the oat sowing is disrupted by the arrival of the beast who kills one of the attendants before attacking the pair. Interestingly, after knocking the knight over, it moves on Marianne but abruptly stops after smelling her scent. Luckily, with the arrival of more men, a figure in the distance recalls his beast with a sound, something that Fronsac notices. With that, as the three men practice to improve their aim the next day, Gregoire explains that he will be hunting a man, while Marquis and Manny dealt with the beast. He knows that the beast is only an instrument, a weapon in the hands of a sick mind, one that wants the mystery of the beast to endure. The master and animal are also linked to the book spreading like wildfire, which maintained the beast had come to punish the king for his indulgence on philosophers. As the trio make camp in the woods, we catch sight of an underground cult nearby that were feeding dogs to the beast. And Manny? Does he not miss his tribe? His tribe no longer exists. Here, Fronsac tells Marquis the pox had decimated Manny's village long before their attack. The men then received orders to execute all the survivors, and only Manny was able to escape. His captain essentially wanted a Mohawk interpreter, and so Fronsac began to teach him their language. Despite catching Manny then slitting the captain's throat a few weeks later, Fronsac let it slide, knowing the captain was a horrible person. He then adopted Manny as a little brother, and the two have been inseparable since. Given an Indian sacrament that would enable him to see what Manny claimed cannot be seen, Marquis has a massive trip and wakes up to find the hunt is on. Manny had somehow called forth the spirits of the forest, and the wolves had chased the beast to their location, enabling them to wound it with a number of traps that they'd set. With Fronsac tending to Marquis, who nearly has his arm torn off, Manny and a wolf chase the beast into the forest and stumble on the lair. Unfortunately, Despite the warrior putting up a valiant effort and taking out a number of cultists, distracted by the woman he saved at the very beginning, he's eventually overpowered and mortally wounded. Finding the broken body of his brother, Fronsac goes full Rambo, exacting furious vengeance on the hunters. Finding a printing press and many copies of the book, he takes a number of them out before escaping with his life. But before he has a chance to finish the job the following day, he's apprehended for disrupting the peace while cremating his brother. By virtue of the powers invested in me by Monsieur Lafont, I must ask you to follow us without resistance. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Visiting his cell, Sylvia orders the jailers to feed him and explains he'll be hanged before he had a chance to write to the king for help. She also reveals that a confidential letter had been given to the Pope from Sardis two years ago, announcing the creation of a secret society. Named the Brotherhood, their aim was to spread and defend the word of the church by any means. The beast <coughs> is a warning to the king. Respect the power of God and the risk of the apocalypse. Of course, Sardis then went mad with unchecked power, and the group began calling themselves the Wolves of God. Rome essentially had no control over the organization, which is why Sylvia had been sent to put an end to the order. And so, the woman has crafted a cunning plan to see that her mission is completed. Faking Fronsac's death by temporarily stopping his heart, Sylvia then digs up his grave and revives the night. At the same time, with the broken-hearted Marianne threatening to undo stability in Gévaudan by telling the king his naturalist had died, the wolves arranged to have her poisoned. Offering to save her from this fate, the demented Jean-Francois proposes she run away with him instead. Despite her refusal, he reveals his true colors by attacking her. Rescuing her from the manner of horror, Marquis and his attendant take her to the safety of his home, as the gigachad known as Fronsac infiltrated the wolves of God. Imagine, brothers, what shall happen if all the provinces in the kingdom were then attacked by other beasts. Aided by the agents of the Holy See, when the secret society meet up again that night, Fronsac reveals the identity of all the members and delivers retribution. Killing a horde of warriors, he finally confronts Jean-Francois and defeats the master of the beast in style. While Sardis escapes into the mountains, a pack of wolves guided by the spirit of Manny tear him apart, and using medicine from Manny's bracelet, Fronsac is able to bring his dear Marianne back from the brink of death. We're then transported to the future, where an aged Marquis is finishing his manuscript. 
Explaining he and Fronsac had entered the lair of the beast that night, he reveals it lied severely wounded. Licking the hands of Fronsac as it died, the pair realize it wasn't a monster, but a lion that Jean Francois brought back from Africa as a cub. Tortured into becoming a vicious devil through cruelty and trained to wear spiked metal armor, beneath its terrifying exterior was a creature wanting the suffering to end. And so, taking pity on the animal, he killed the beast in an act of mercy. Thus died the beast of Gévaudan, though in truth, the real beast was Jean Francois. As Thomas Marquis is led to his execution, he tells us Fronsac invited him to join them in Africa, but the province needed rebuilding. Considering the damage the other noblemen had done, he felt as though he was beholden to his people to stay. While saddened that he will never see them again, he rejoices in the knowledge that they were happy together. As the French Revolution kicks into full gear, the final shot reveals Fronsac and Marianne sailing on a ship named the Brother Wolf. I've often thought of Grégoire and Marianne. I never saw them again, but it pleases me to think that they lived their lives happily. With that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that voted we cover the Brotherhood of the Wolf. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe to stay up to date on all my content, and if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film and Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.